recently, we were uh, contacted by uh, a company called Vandalay Industries. Anybody heard of Vandalay Industries? Ah, all right, all right. Uh, they're a uh, latex manufacturing company. Uh, and <clears throat> good, I got some fans. Uh, they have contacted us because they're looking to hire a salesman named George. I want you guys to meet George. <laughs> we try not to take ourselves too seriously. Um, we pick on George a good bit at Vision Spark. Uh, George is that. Uh, quintessential model of uh, a, a potential bad hire. Uh, it sounds like we have some Seinfeld, Seinfeld fans in the room. Yes, I see some heads nodding. Good, good. Uh, so, George is that quintessential guy, and w what we want to do real quick is a little interaction. Like I said, we're, I want to get you guys talking a bit, uh, so hopefully you've had some coffee. I'm going to have Meg come up. Meg is with us. Meg Jenkins with uh, Vision Spark. She's our account specialist and handles some of our interviewing. So she's going to uh, take notes because I can't spell to save my life. Um, but what we want to talk about is think through George. Would you hire George as your latex salesman? This scenario, he's trying to pull a fast one on the unemployment office, but is it hard to believe that he would do the same thing for a potential employer? Probably not. And if you're true fans, you've seen George and some other uh, work-related experiences, uh, and he, he doesn't exactly shine. So what are some traits, behaviors, values that George, or driving home a little more, uh, someone you may have worked with, or I know none of you have hired any Georges uh, for your company, uh, but tell me, tell us, uh, shout it out there. Traits, values, behaviors of a bad hire, someone like George, someone that has maybe snuck into your organization. Go ahead. Lazy. Lazy. <clears throat> what else? Entitlement. Entitlement. Dishonest. All right, abrasive. Abrasive. A shirker. A shirker. A shirker. All right, I'll test Meg if she knows how to spell that. <laughs> What else? Selfish. Selfish. Unqualified. Unqualified. Good. Doesn't care. Doesn't care. Manipulator. Good one. Yes. Good one. Yes, sir. Yes. He doesn't tell the story, he just has a solution. There you go. Know it all. <laughs> know it all. Controlling. Good. Thank you. That is a good list. So, traits, values, and behaviors of a bad hire, and our fun example, George. So how do you keep the Georges out of the company? Another question, too, to think through this is, and we're, we're going to talk about that, what are these people costing your company when they get in? When they're hired and we find out that this stuff comes out after they've been hired. Alex and talk about that briefly. Have any of you ever found out what it costs your company for a mishire, for a bad hire? The lowest statistic that we've seen on a mishire is 30% of their annual salary. That was a study done by, done by Cornell University recently. So if George is making or a, a, a mishire is making $50,000 a year, that's going to cost your company at minimum $15,000, if I'm doing the math correctly, at minimum. Most studies are even higher than that. Some studies have said 10 to 15 times their annual salary. So if you do the math 
a $50,000 employee is going to could cost your company $750,000. Most research comes together and it costs three times annual salary. So that's what we like to say. So if you're hiring a $50,000 a year position and you make a mistake, it will cost your organization $150,000. Now you're probably asking what are some of these costs? Well, there's direct costs. These costs are advertising, employment agency, recruiting, job fairs, credit checks, criminal background checks, <laughs> examination and testing, signing bonuses, college recruiting, internet costs, training costs, and the most important one is, is lost income from lost customers, customers leaving, revenue. When the study said 15 times their annual salary, this, this is probably the impact. They made a bad decision, affected a, a customer, whether it was on the quality <coughs> end, customer service end. There's also indirect costs. Okay, These bad hires have lower productivity, higher turnover costs, morale issues. I'll talk about that later. Safety, disruption of regular business functions, overtime costs, hiring to maintain production, maybe bringing in some temps or things like that, legal costs and potential lawsuits. Julie Young is going to talk about this later. Julie is a phenomenal employment law attorney, and she's helped my companies out of some binds uh, in the past. I had a mailing company, and my conversation to Julie, I'd call her up and I'd say, hey, Julie, can I fire this person? And so that was my typical question to Julie, and she's awesome. And she will come later to talk about how to uh, mitigate your legal costs in an organization. So let me ask a question to you. When is the best time to get rid of a bad employee? As soon as possible. As soon as possible. Right. The best time to dismiss a marginal performer is during the interview process. Thanks, Alec. So it's expensive to make a hiring mistake. And it's costly, and we just talk numbers, but we can also think through what's the impact on your company from a, a cultural standpoint when that person that gets in there that just doesn't quite fit. Uh, so what we're going to look at now is how do we keep this from happening? We took time uh, to discuss the bad traits, behaviors, and values uh, of, of a George. Uh, we're going to flip that a little bit and take time to discuss what are some good traits you look for. Let's imagine again we're all working for Vandalay Industries and we're going to hire a, a sales manager. Meg's going to help us out again. Uh, and I'm, I, I want you guys to shout it out again. You did a great job the first time around. Let's do it again. So what are traits, values, and behaviors of a, a superstar? Engaged. Engaged. Accountable. Accountable, good. Motivated. <coughs> Loyal. Loyal. High integrity. High integrity, good. Has a track record. Track record. What else? Team player. Good. <clears throat> Excellent. What was that? Excellent quality. Excellent quality. Flexible. Flexible. Good. These are great. Passion. Passionate. Confident. Ethical. Ethical, yep. That's a great list. Thank you. This is what we refer to at Vision Spark as the who. We want to hire for the who. Another way of saying it is, and I'm sure you've heard this before, hire for attitude. You know, hire for attitude, train for skill. Unfortunately, most companies hire for what, and then they end up firing for who. Let me unpack that a little bit. Most companies take a look at the what, which is the I think, job description, the, the roles, the responsibilities, 
uh, the tasks, the duties that the job is going to perform. And then they find someone they like, because a lot of times what happens is we, we try to qualify someone for a job because we like them. And then they end up getting into the position, and this stuff comes out, and we have to fire them for the who, for that stuff that's a little harder to see. Again, just kind of reiterating this, we call it the what and the ticket. <clears throat> like I said, the what, job responsibilities and requirements. The ticket is the resume stuff, skills, experiences, uh, education, training, certification. That's usually what companies are taking into consideration when making hiring decisions. And there may be one or two interviews along the way, uh, but this is what goes into it. And we find someone whose ticket matches what we're looking for. We like them and we do our best to qualify them for the job. At Vision Spark, we focus on the who. Behaviors, values, character. Alec, Meg, and I are passionate about finding top performers. And the main way we do that is through custom recruiting, training, and consulting. And our emphasis in this process, we don't throw out the what and the ticket, but the emphasis is the who. And we build questions around that. And that's what I want to stress with you today, is the who is where you need to start. And if you have written vision, mission, values for your company, that's a great source for your interview questions. So we can start finding these people, these superstars that have the who that will line up, up with what lines up with our mission. So real quickly, I'm going to have Meg step up here for a second. Meg, like I said, is our account specialist and handles a lot of the front-end interviewing for us, which I'll kind of go over here in a second. But she's got a quick little story to share. So I do, like, uh, like Adam said, I do a lot of the interviewing. And what I'm focusing on is the who, like he's talking about. So I'm looking for the values, um, their behaviors, their character, that sort of thing. So we have a series of questions that we ask them. They're open-ended questions, and I have a response guide that I'm using. I'm looking for certain things in their answers. Um, so a good example of this is, um, I guess it's been probably a few weeks ago now, but we were filling a district manager position. Um, and I was interviewing a candidate that came highly recommended, actually, by the person doing the hiring. She had a great resume, friendly personality. I loved talking to her on the phone. She was someone that I would want to go get coffee with or go shopping with. But whenever I probed for her, um, her character, her values, her behaviors, and asked those questions, she did very poorly on it. And that told us that she was not a good fit for this job. She wasn't a good candidate. So we actually ended up um, nixing her. And the hiring guy, the guy that was doing the hiring, um, was very thankful that we would do that because he said, I would have hired her. But with our process, we were able to determine that some of those core behaviors just weren't there. Thank you, Meg. So we have here the Choosing Winner system. You guys have in the black folder a handout that goes a little more in depth. I won't spend all the time on our system. Uh, what I want to stress at this point is the importance of some kind of repeatable system that you use every time when making hiring decisions. This is a couple of things that we've done today that you can take back and do yourselves. Uh, the defined step is our first step in our process when we're doing uh, some sort of search. And you just got a little sneak peek to that step. It is a brainstorm where we sit down with all of the key decision makers, supervisor, peers, even direct reports of this person that's going to be hired, and we say, okay, who is it we're looking for? And we do what we just did with you all. Brainstorm session, no wrong answers, we just get it all up on paper. And then we go through and we, we put the what. Okay, what is this person going to be doing? Because a lot of times, that's not real clear. And then we focus on the ticket. And we do that in a couple hour brainstorm session, again, with two to three different groups uh, during that day. And that really helps us build out a position profile. And it gives us the blueprint for who we're looking to, to hire. The next step, we take that position profile and we create a scoring rubric. We don't read resumes, we score them. Uh, it's not a pass-fail, but it allows us to give weight to certain resumes. Once we go from there, it's a screen, and that's what Meg was talking about. We have scripted questions with a response guide. We're looking for specific answers. 
It's a behavioral interviewing model, which we highly recommend. The examine step is a more extensive screener along with a behavioral and personality assessment. That's something else I stress, a part of your process. There are many assessments, many good assessments out there. Use it. It gives you much more information and, again, allows you to, to uncover this, the, the deeper stuff. Uh, and then also they sit down with us in a one-to-one -one interview. So before we send our three finalists to a client, uh, we've, they've gone through four different rounds of interviews. And then the confirm, another easy thing to implement for you. When you're making a hiring decision, the people you created that brainstorm session with, got everything up there, need to be a part of the interviewing process on the back end. We have all three candidates, the finalists come in and sit down with each one of those groups. One-to-one -one interview style, even group interview style. So it really allows everybody to compare apples to apples and oranges to oranges. Let me pause for a second. Questions? Did I gloss over anything? Anything someone has any curious about? Anything along the way? I just want to make sure. Yeah, Carl. How do you uh, find questions that, I mean, I feel like a lot of the interview questions that you see in general are kind of meant to provoke particular answers. How do you find questions that aren't that way that, I mean, are you looking for questions that don't have a specific, obvious answer that you're looking for? And how do you, how do, you do that? Yeah, the questions we use, again, it's part of our, our, our system, kind of quote-unquote secret sauce. But what I encourage people to do is develop those open-ended questions kind of around behavioral interviewing. And what that means is you're asking questions along the way like, uh, give me an example when. Or tell me about a time you did X, Y, and Z. And then go deeper. Say, what was your thinking along the way? It really gets us away from, well, tell me about your strengths and weaknesses. And I know that's a kind of a gloss over high level view, and we could talk about that more in depth later as well. But go with those open ended questions that really dig into results, results, results. So they can give specific examples, because that's really what you're, you're looking for. Any other questions? Okay, good. Alex, can you just come up here and talk a little further? <coughs> So over the years, I've done a lot of interviewing, and, and if, if you were like me, you would prepare for an interview by getting a resume out of the file or on your computer as the person was in the lobby saying, hey, Sally's here for the interview. Oh, oh okay, let me look over this resume real quickly. And then you're like, okay, uh, come on in. Uh, tell me, you worked at uh, Apple. What did, what did you do for them? And the whole time, you're trying to qualify them for the position if you like them, okay? It needs to be the opposite. You need to have the guise of disqualifying them. And if you can't disqualify them, that's a good sign. Believe it or not, we tend to uh, not hire correctly. A University of Michigan study says that we have a 55% chance of hiring successfully if we interview well and check references. Okay, 55%, that's like flipping a coin, right, and hoping. And most of the time when we check references, we say, hey, uh, think about hiring Sally. What do you think? Oh, Sally's great. Hire her. You know, she was, and that's it. Hey, I checked her references, and then you find out she's cost your company a lot of money when it's a bad decision. So in your packets, we've given you some phenomenal interview questions. These are the, use these reference questions. My favorite ones are the last couple. It says, tell me about a time, um, it says, uh, tell me in which ways this person was difficult to work with. And my favorite one is, if you had a magic wand, what would be the one thing you would change about this person? Okay, use these questions. They, they will be an instrument in your hiring process. So the last point that I would like to make is investing in top performers will improve your bottom line. If you can't tell by now, I'm a numbers guy. Okay, I love P&Ls balance sheets, things like that. I love statistics. They hit home for me. One of my favorite studies was done by a Gallup organization. And if you know me, I share this, this research a lot because this hits home. And every time we do a presentation, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or in person, people are like, man, this is really good stuff. So the study by the Gallup organization, they've interviewed thousands and thousands of employees and managers, and they found out that only a quarter of the people 26%, give or take a few percentage points, a quarter of the people are engaged in an organization. Okay, These are the people, they're your top performers, you want more people like them, 
They believe in you. They believe in your vision, mission, and value. When obstacles come, they're there, and they're, they're wanting to overcome it. You want more people like them. The rest of the organization, three-fourths of the organization, are disengaged. 55% of them are your nine-to-fivers. They come in, they clock in, they clock out. They're thankful for a job. If they're offered a job somewhere else, they're going to go because they don't care. They're not engaged in your company. And then you have these bottom 19%. These bottom 19% are actively disengaged. They are working in the opposite direction of your company. They're poison. They create rumors. They have absentee issues. They're the George Costanzas in your company. So the same study by the Gallup organization had some great results. And if you spend some time interviewing well, engaging employees, if you're in the top half of your competition, if you're in the 50% uh, better range than your competition, you're going to have a 44% reduction in turnover. A 56% increase in customer loyalty, 50% increase in productivity, and a 30% increase in profitability. Just by working a little bit, just being in the top section will improve your bottom line. Okay? Now, companies, your competition can replicate your processes and sometimes even your products if you don't have patents. They can replicate a lot. They can replicate your marketing strategies. But what they cannot replicate are your top performers. So let me take this, let me hit, hit this home a little bit. We had a client recently who called us up, and they were devastated. They are an engineering company, and they do work for some very large companies. And they are passionate about helping these companies avoid any downtime in their manufacturing process. So they had their team work over Christmas. Not just over Christmas, but on Christmas. They worked 16 hours Christmas Eve, 16 hours Christmas Day, 16 hours every day that week, including New Year's Eve and New Year's Day. They lost every bit of profit on that job because of a bad hire. What would the results have been had he invested time in making a good hiring decision? So today, we told you that mishires cost you a lot of money. Hire for the who. Look at the values, traits, characteristics of your candidates. Try to dig them out. And investing in top performers will improve your bottom line. So if you're interested in talking more about this, you want to learn more, we have some lunch and learns coming up. So how do you attract how do you attract and retain developed millennial employees? These are your Generation Y employees. How to attract superstars. How do you get people to come to your company? And most of the time, people that are interviewing are out of work. Sometimes they're really good people. Sometimes they are the superstars. <clears throat> Oftentimes they're not. Your superstars are working elsewhere. So how do you get them to come to you? So we're going to talk about that. And then how do you get people engaged in your company and that subject is creating an onboarding plan. So we have these three lunch and learns. Your price of admission automatically includes you in these teachings. And there's some information on your handouts about when they are. So, Alex, yes. I do want to say before we go to questions and surveys, uh, coming up later on the, the engagement piece is going to be Carrie. And I just want to give a, a personal note. Uh, Carrie's book actually deeply impacted me on a personal level. Uh, probably more so than many of the books I've read, and that it's truth, not a pitch. Uh, Alec and I went through our, our a ten session cohort with Carrie, so I just encourage you listen, take good notes. We are we're fortunate to have him here. Yeah, real quick on uh, on Carrie. Uh, Carrie, I have I had his book. I read the first chapter of the, of the book, and the next day I was meeting with a guy, and he was just sharing some stuff, and I said read this book. So then I had another copy of Carrie's book. And my wife picked it up, and then I lost that copy. So um, it's awesome. Adam and I went through a 10-session training with Carrie, and it was phenomenal, absolutely life-changing. I know when I look back at my life, Carrie's going to be one of those guys that say, man, he was a life-changer. 
And so I, that's why he's here today. He's here to help organizations engage their employees and even help you become more engaged in what you do. And that's how he's helped us. So um, before we transition to Julie, what kind of questions do you have about hiring, things along those lines? I'm just curious, in that engineering example that you gave, what was the general trait that that employee had that, was, that caused all that ruckus? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the employee and it's the, this customer said the same thing that we talked about today. It's the people that interview well that say, I can do the job. I can do a good job, right? Oh, I can do that. I've done that. Oh, I can do that. And then you hire them believing that they can and they cannot. Other questions? All right. Oh, yes, Carl. <clears throat> can you share in that specific example what kind of questions? I mean, I know you said that's your secret sauce, but what type of questions you would have asked to? Yeah, that is our secret sauce. And that would be like KFC giving out their recipe and, <laughs> and uh, Coca-Cola. We guard it secretly. But I would, I would encourage you to have questions like, uh, give me an example of when this happens. Adam talked about that. Or tell me how you being um, sensitive to others has paid dividends. Tell me about a time when you having good communication skills has paid dividends. Those are kind of good types of questions. So. Hey, Alex. I would jump in there and just add um, something that is really awesome about our questions is I know what I'm looking for in their answers. So when I talk about having a response guide, I know kind of what I want them to say, and I think that's an important part of knowing what you're asking too. Because if you're trying to qualify someone, if you've already decided that you like them, <coughs> you're going to try to qualify their answer if you don't know what you're looking for specifically. interview you're, you're hiring for the new. Right. Um, however, there is a certain amount of importance to knowing that they can manipulate that software or they can do whatever. They can they can if they're a clerical person they can work in work. Right. Whatever. Okay so So what is what do you see the, the percentage of that first interview? What do you see the, the percentage of knowledge, skills and ability mm -hmm. that you want to wash out versus the Okay, great question. So before you even interview them, you need to score their resume. Okay, so Adam talked about that earlier. So in the initial brainstorming, you have the who and the what and the ticket. And you're going to put down on there what is required of them. So one to two years of college, one year experience in leading others. Um, they need to know these certifications. So before you even interview them, you score their resume. And those that, those that make it through, that, that's who you interview. So you kind of know they're qualified already. Yeah. And, you dig, and then that interview, you dig down and you, you go into the requirements. And we also check on um, gaps in employment, if they were out of work for a while. Uh, we find out if they've ever been fired, which is, is a red flag sometimes, um, or even laid off. You have to dig a little deeper. Why were they the ones laid off and not somebody else? Things like that. Other questions? What about the time issue? You're a business, you lose someone unexpectedly, and you have to fill that position. And you're looking at time. Yes. Is lost productivity, I've got to get somebody in here now. How do you go through? Good, good question. So the best thing is to be proactive. We say the ABCs of hiring are always be recruiting, okay? So you're always talking to people. We actually interviewed, or I reached out to Meg for a part-time position, and she said she wasn't interested in part-time, but I, was, I had already talked to her. So when the full-time position came open, I went to my bench, Hey, Meg, would you be interested in talking to us about an interview specialist position? So always be recruiting. And, and two, that is the, the pain. We've all been in that situation. Uh, but we, we stress to hire slow, fire fast. So fight that temptation. You've got that open position. It may feel like money is slipping away. But like we said earlier, the cost of a bad person in that role is going to be even greater than that time kind of you're taking your time and really putting effort into the hiring process. You know, I didn't mention this earlier, but not even talking about people and hiring. Companies, when they're looking to install a piece of equipment in, in your organization, 
they will get their CPAs out and their business analysts out and they'll do a, a cost analysis. They'll see if that equipment will have a return on the investment. What's that equipment gonna save us or make us? But we don't do that when it comes to hiring. 